Hi everyone, and thanks for coming to this talk. This is the ballot is busted before the blockchain is security analysis of votes, which is the first internet application used in US federal elections. My name is Mike Spector. This is joint work with Jimmy Koppel and Danny Weitzner, and we're from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. So in February, the state of West Virginia abruptly abandoned plans to adopt an internet voting phone app called Votes. This research is why. It also serves as a great case study for explaining why we should be careful for advocating for the introduction of new technologies and civic processes. And it also highlights the need for transparency and accountability in election systems in particular. The story states starts in late 2019 when it became clear that West Virginia was going to pass a bill directing the Secretary of State to allow disabled voters to cast their ballots over the internet. This is important because West Virginia has a higher than average number of disabled voters. For example, according to CDC, 22% of adults in West Virginia have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs. 7.7% uh, have some sort of uh, vision impairment. Interestingly, West Virginia had already been using votes for, over, for overseas military voters, or UOCAVA voters, uh, leading us to believe that they would likely be used uh, for this expansion as well. So, given the potential impact, uh, we wanted to know how votes provided the essential security guarantees uh, required in voting. Uh, this is commonly, these are commonly defined in literature as correctness, privacy, receipt freeness, and coercion resistance. Additionally, votes made heavy, uh, claimed they make heavy, heavy use of cryptography, including things like hardware back key storage, mixed nets, and of course, the blockchain. This led us to wonder whether or not uh, votes was end-to-end -end verifiable. End-to-end -end verifiability allows a voter to tell if their ballot was counted correctly in the final tally, and given the use of cryptography that was reported here, it would be an expected guarantee of the system. A key challenge we had was that we couldn't touch their back-end infrastructure and therefore had to make assumptions. Our solution to this was to manually reverse engineer the app and iteratively re-implement the server from the static analysis. We would further assume the best possible situation situation for the back end uh, if we couldn't confirm some action. And whenever we deviated from this assumption, we explicitly discussed why in this paper. In the end, uh, we found five high severity vulnerabilities and serious privacy issue. We found that there were many basic implementation failures, including uh, mandated use of weak passwords uh, that resulted in an easily brute forceable encrypted database. Uh, we found that their anti-tamper slash antivirus solution was very easily circumventable. Uh, we also found that the app would send a photo of the user's ID, uh, driver's license or passport, and their physical location to a third party without alerting the user that this was going on. We further found that their API server could completely control the user's vote surreptitiously, which was surprising given the purported use of a blockchain. And what we found was that there was no proof of inclusion sent back to the device. We further found that there was a receipt that was uh, used in this, but it was very unlikely that this receipt represented any sort of known and ten -ver verifiable scheme. Here is a summary of the adversaries that we modeled and the things that we believe that an attacker would be able to do. Um, I will leave explanation of all of this to the uh, paper um, but I wanted to go through one particular attack, and this is the passive network adversary attack, um, because I thought it was felt it was particularly interesting. To understand this attack, we first have to get into details of the protocol. Um, first, the device establishes a standard HTTPS uh, connection to Votes' API server, and everything that follows actually goes over HTTPS. Then, on top of this, it will perform the following non-standard home-rolled crypto protocol. First, the phone will generate 100 ECDSA key pairs, uh, and then immediately discards all but the 57th. Then the device sends all 100 public keys to the server. Uh, the server will generate its own 100 keys, perform key agreement with the sender's 57th public key, generate a random value which will later be used as the AAS-GCM shared key, then encrypt the AAS-GCM shared key with the ECDSA uh, uh, key, and sends the client its 100 public keys. Finally, the phone will perform its own key agreement, decrypt the AES-GCM key, and from this point forward, all communications are AES-GCM encrypted uh, using that shared key. 
Now, this is non-standard and has uh, very unclear security benefits, especially since there's no actual uh, signing of the key, public keys themselves, uh, but it isn't necessarily insecure on its own. So to explain why this complicates matters, I first have to explain uh, the structure of ballot information as it is sent between the server and the client. So on the left is what a ballot looks like in app when the user is selecting their preferred candidate in an example election. Uh, this is generated from JSON uh, strings sent by the server, uh, which are variable length depending on the description of the candidate. For example, you can see the corresponding JSON sent from the server to the client on the right for the display on the left. Anyway, when a user submits their ballot, um, the vote is then sent to the server as all of the metadata of the voter's choice, but only that candidate's metadata. The end result is a textbook side channel attack that was made far worse by the custom crypto protocol involved. To understand why, uh, one has to think a little bit about how normal HTTPS traffic works. Uh, in normal HTTPS uh, traffic, plain text is somewhat obfuscated by gzip compression, uh, and in votes protocol, the plain text is encrypted before gzip gets the, a chance. The result is that if you know the length of the ballot options, you can very obviously tell which options the voters selected. This image graphs the size of packets sent from the device to the server immediately after a vote submission for the candidate with the short and long description is sent. Note that you can clearly tell which packet is the vote submission and which candidate is the long candidate. The end result is that a passive network adversary like say the user's ISP can trivially determine uh, the user's ballot selections. So since these attacks are sort of obvious failings of design, a natural question would be how the system ended up being fielded uh, without someone saying something or noticing in the first place. And I think the reason is obfuscation. In fact, it appears that significant effort was made to hide the system's design. Uh, so while analysis of this sort of analysis was easy, Actually, getting to the point where we could do that analysis was incredibly difficult. First, for example, there was an explicit lack of documentation. Uh, the only documentation that existed, in fact, was an FAQ with a bunch of security claims. There was no formal description of the system, no security reviews were made public, uh, no list of fixed vulnerabilities from those security reviews, uh, and then there were these sort of claims that were very unclear. Uh, at first glance, uh, these look like cryptographic guarantees, but actually in reality, there, there's no formal definition. Uh, for example, end-to-end -end vote encryption doesn't actually mean anything, but end-to-end -end verifiability does. So these are sort of near misses of things that actually exist in the literature. Second, the binary itself was also obfuscated um, using a COTS uh, product called ProGuard, which comes embedded in Android, admittedly. But in addition, all protocol strings, which uh, were obfuscated using this runtime obfuscation protocol, um, what's generally called a string encoding scheme. This is common in games, DRM kits, and particularly in the command and control strings used in malware. Um, it also used a non-standard 57th key protocol, as I described before, uh, and the bug bounty version of the app was also obfuscated. It's important to note that there's no concrete security benefit of any of this obfuscation, uh, except it does make independent analysis significantly harder. To make matters worse, a previous attempt at doing a security analysis resulted in a U of M researcher being investigated by the FBI. Uh, while we couldn't find any indication that this, this you know, bothered the company, uh, we instead found quotes like this. Um, their reaction worried us so much that we actually uh, it actually complicated our ability to disclose the results of our work. Um, their justification for reporting the researcher also appears to be that DHS has designated election systems as critical infrastructure. We actually agreed with this assessment, uh, so we reported to CISA, which is the department in DHS that actually handles these incidents. Once we had confirmation that there were no active users of the system, we released a preprint of this paper. Votes' response, uh, to say the least, was not encouraging. Um, they began by calling us fudsters, um, and then they sort of had two main complaints. The first was a claim that we had used an older version of the app, which was not true, uh, and that our methodology was somehow unrealistic. 
It's important to note that they didn't actually refute any of the vulnerabilities or the results of our study themselves. And interestingly, these sorts of details appear to be a long-standing tradition in the market. Uh, in fact, these arguments are identical to Diebold's response in a previous study that found faults in their systems. Votes then uh, revealed that they had hired Trail of Bits, a third-party security firm in New York, uh, which then released a report which confirmed all of the vulnerabilities and confirmed that they existed in the most recent version of the app. They confirmed the severity of the vulnerabilities, and they confirmed that they had confirmed this to votes prior to votes speaking to the press. They also validated our methodology uh, and then found many server-side issues that we couldn't have found, including the fact that AV wasn't running during their past elections, and a host of 40 other issues. It's important to note that this still is not an independent audit. Okay, so let's take a step back and talk about what we can learn about this going forward. A lot can be summed up by reading this quote by Bradley Tusk, which is Votes Backer and Mobile Voting Project founder. Uh, and he says that it's not that cybersecurity people are bad people, per se. I think that it's they're solving for one situation and I'm solving for another. They want zero technology risk in any way, shape, or form. I am solving for the problem of turnout. And to sort of abstract this a bit, what he's saying is that we should solve a policy problem through uh, new technology. The problem here is that uh, when you do that, you're inherently adding risks from the technology itself that may be poorly understood. And in this case, how to do remote electronic voting, remote only electronic voting, is still an open research problem. Compounding this issue, it, are the information asymmetries between the vendors and the election administrators purchasing the product as well as the voters themselves. All right, so what should we take away from this? Well, we gave in the paper the following recommendations. First, we should fight efforts that to increase this information asymmetry. Second, because of number one, we should provide universal public scrutiny of deployed election systems before they are fielded. And three, we should uphold standards of software independence, verifiability, and transparency in election systems. And for everything else, we should take a hard look. Thank you, and please go vote.